Another form of market failure that we need to understand at AS is asymmetry of information and how that can lead to some quite serious market failures um, and in, in some cases the absence of a market altogether. What do we mean by information asymmetry first of all? Well, information asymmetry can be said to exist if there is a situation where one economic actor knows more than the other. And by economic actor, um, in this context, we mean the buyer or the seller. Um, now, it does work both ways. Um, the, the example that we're going to look at, first of all, is where the uh, the seller has more information. Um, but then towards the end of the video, I'm going to go through a, a, the, a, a situation that explains what happens when the buyer has more information. Now, a lot of these ideas of information asymmetry are very associated with an economist uh, called George Akerlof, who won the Nobel Prize in 2001 for um, his work on, on these sorts of problems. Um, there were a couple of other economists that, uh, that won the prize the same year, um, also for looking at, uh, at asymmetry, although they looked more at... Uh, uh, kind of a, a how it could be dealt with and so on. So it, it was Akerlof who mainly looked at the problem of market uh, market failure caused by information asymmetry. And the uh, the example that he used in his work was to consider the market for used cars and particularly uh, consider why uh, a used car, even if it's kind of a very new, new used car, sold for so much less than, uh, than a brand new car. So uh, we're going to run through the same example here. Um, it's known as Akerlof's Lemons, um, and, uh, and hopefully that will explain uh, what information asymmetry is and why it can cause market failure. So to think about this, um, we need to kind of envisage a situation where we've got uh, we've got two cars. Uh, one is a high quality car worth four thousand pounds. The other is a low quality car worth one thousand um, pounds. Now we've got our um, car dealer. Uh, this is our dealer, okay. And obviously the dealer is the expert, so he knows he or she knows which car is which. So he he knows which car is the high quality car and which car um, is the low quality car. We also have our buyer over here. Now the buyer is not a car expert. And so what that means is that actually the buyer is unable to tell which car is the high quality car and which car is the low quality car just by looking at them. So the information asymmetry here is that the dealer knows which car is which, the buyer is uncertain. And that's what generates the situation of information asymmetry. Let's have a look at how that plays out and how that can cause market failure. I suppose the important thing to just make clear here is that, uh, as we've seen already in economics, the buyer will be willing to buy the product if the value of the product uh, that uh, that the buyer perceives is greater than or equal to the price they have to pay. Obviously, then they're not going to buy a car if it costs them more to buy than uh, than they think it's worth. If there was no information asymmetry, if there was perfect information in this market, this would then simply come down to an informed choice by the consumer. Are they willing to pay more to get the high quality car or are they essentially willing to take the chance um, with the low quality car because it's cheaper? Um, and that's, a, that's a, a, a straightforward rational decision down to the preferences of the consumer and that will be fine. But what we really need to consider here is the impact that the information asymmetry has on the buyer's decision making and therefore the dealer's decision making in this process. The decision being faced obviously by the, the dealer is that they will sell if the price that they receive for the car is greater than or equal to the value of the car itself. Now what this should result in is a nice uh, straightforward equilibrium where high quality cars find a, an equilibrium at 4000 and low quality cars find an equilibrium at 1000. But because of the information asymmetry, that doesn't happen. Now, to start with, we'll just think about things from the buyer's point of view. So what does a buyer know? A buyer knows that a high quality car is worth 4,000. The buyer also knows that the low quality car is only worth 1,000. The problem the buyer has is they don't know which is which. So what that means is if they walk into a car showroom, are they going to be willing to pay 4,000 pounds for a car? Probably not, because they are not going to be confident that that car is of a high quality. Because essentially they know that the dealer could put two cars in front of them and the buyer wouldn't have any idea which one is the high quality car. So what does the buyer do? They start to factor that in when they think about the amount that they are willing to pay for the cars. And rather than 
treating these essentially as two separate products, a high quality one worth four and a low quality one worth £1,000. What essentially the buyer will start to do in their heads is they will essentially start to treat them all the same because they don't know which ones are which. And they would be willing to only offer a price somewhere in the middle. Now, if they, if they thought there was a 50-50 chance, that price would presumably be halfway between the two at £2,500. So what that means is the buyer walks into the car showroom thinking that uh, that because they, they can't be sure that they're going to get a high quality car, the uh, the maximum essentially that they're going to be willing to pay for a car is £2,500. So let's think about what that means then for the dealer. Let's bring the dealer back into this. So the dealer, remember, is only going to sell if the price that uh, that they will receive for doing so is greater or equal to the value of the car. Um, now, what we can clearly see is that if the buyer is, is essentially treating all cars the same and is only willing to pay £2,500 for them, then the low quality car will be sold because... Uh, it's only worth a thousand pounds. The high quality car, though, won't. The dealer won't offer this car for sale because, essentially, it it's not. They won't get enough for selling it. So they uh, they remove this this car from uh, from the sale, and then the buyers are only left with the low quality cars. So this is the first form of, of the market failure, that essentially we end up with a situation where the, the bad quality cars, the low quality cars, drive out the higher quality cars from the marketplace. And the even more substantial uh, failure in this market is then that the removal of these high quality cars means that the average value of cars left also falls. What that means is that the buyers will start to Think about this number, and this number will start to fall, the amount they're willing to pay for cars. And what that means is the lower the amount they're willing to pay goes, the the more high and middle quality cars leave the market. And in the end, all we are left with for sale are the low quality cars, um, which obviously the, the, the buyers may well not want. So we've got essentially kind of two forms of market failure in operation here. One is uh, a relatively standard kind of allocative inefficiency, the fact that uh, there are there are high quality cars which could bring benefit to the consumers which aren't being uh, consumed. Um, the other market failure is that actually uh, without some action, this could actually destroy the market because essentially what this will mean is that the, the average quality of cars will just go down and down and down and down. And that's the nature of the market failure, which was um, put forward by George Akerlof. Now, there are a number of things that the dealer can do, if we think about the dealer here, to try and convince the buyer of the value of a car and essentially to make the uh, to make the high quality car an attractive option where the buyer would actually be willing to pay the higher amount of money for it. Because if we remember, the reason that the consumer was only willing to pay two and a half thousand pounds was because they weren't sure whether the car was high quality or not. So how do dealers try and convince consumers that uh, that their cars are of high quality? Well, this is why they offer things like warranties um, or extended service agreements, um, things like that, where basically they are trying to offer the buyer something which will convince them that uh, that the car being offered is of high quality and therefore that uh, that it's worth paying more money for. Because, of course, it's not in the dealer's interest to have a high-quality car sat there that they can't sell. So the dealer wants to sell these cars for £4,000. What they need to do, though, is convince the buyer that, uh, that, that it's essentially worth that money. So dealers... Uh, reputable dealers will spend quite a lot of money trying to convince the buyer that that they are trustworthy and that when they say a car is high quality that that actually is the case. I said at the start of the video I'd briefly touch on uh, on a market that works the other way around. The most common one we use here is to think about insurance um, and insurance is a situation where the uh, the information asymmetry is the other way around. Here the buyer knows more than the seller so if I uh, if I apply for insurance, uh, you know, let's say I apply for well, I mean, any form of insurance, really, um, you know, let's say I apply for life insurance um, or health insurance or even things like car insurance and so on. Um, basically, I, I know more about my life, my health and my driving style than the insurance company do. Um, and as a result of that, we end up with uh, with a situation of, of what we call adverse selection. And this essentially means that 
only the people most likely to need the insurance will actually end up paying for it. Because if all people had to pay the same premiums, then essentially, if, if I knew that, uh, you know, that I was a very healthy person, um, I looked after myself and I drove very carefully, I wouldn't be willing to pay the higher premiums to compensate for those people that weren't. So my choice would then probably be not to have insurance. But that would then cause the same problem as before, because that would mean that the only people who did want insurance were the people who who didn't look after themselves and who didn't drive carefully. And again, that would cause the destruction of the market, because ultimately the only people left getting insurance would be those people who were almost guaranteed to need it. And under those circumstances, the insurer simply wouldn't offer the insurance in the first place. So. Uh, again, how how do we get around this? Well, uh, in most countries, well, in all countries, really, there are laws which dictate the information that you must give uh, when you are applying for insurance. And if the insurer asks you a question, you must answer it honestly. And doing that hopefully will enable the insurance company to identify who are the people at high risk, who are the people at low risk, and then offer them premiums which accommodate for that fact. So really, what what in both cases here, what uh, the solution is to these information gaps is to try and provide the, uh, the buyers and sellers with enough information to view them as two separate markets, the high quality and the low quality. If they can be given enough information to view them as two separate markets and have confidence that they're looking at them as two separate markets, then the information asymmetry uh, market failures should go away because people will be willing to pay the price which is requested.